Welcome back to Left of Boom. I'm Hope Hodgsek, Managing Editor at Military.com. For me, this podcast is a chance to explore in more depth some of the most interesting people and ideas inside the military community. But today we're doing a different variation on this theme and talking to the man who holds one of the most interesting jobs inside the Pentagon. You may have wondered how Hollywood blockbusters can feature scenes of actors launching off an aircraft carrier or driving around a military base in tanks. And the answer is the Defense Department's Entertainment Media Division, which vets scripts and can provide project support ranging from base access to equipment to uniform background actors, assets that might be prohibitively expensive or impossible for studios to source on their own. The first stop for all these scripted projects is Glenn Roberts, DOD's branch chief for entertainment media, and I've been dying to pick his brain about how he decides which projects to recommend for support and just why the U.S. military uses its resources to help out Hollywood. Glenn Roberts, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's great to be here, Hope. You are the Defense Department Branch Chief for Entertainment Media, a job that I've kind of thought of in shorthand as the Pentagon's Hollywood liaison. And I know you got there pretty recently. When did you start at the job? So I started on the 6th of July. So I've been here uh, just about six weeks now. Oh, fantastic. Well, I'll try to go a little bit easier on you then. (laughs) Thanks. So tell me, what exactly do you do in that job and why does that position exist? So our mission, um, you know, our formal explanation is that we inform and educate the public, both the domestic and the foreign public, on the roles and missions uh, of the Department of Defense. That's why we exist really to make sure that Americans know that their taxpayer uh, dollars are being used in good stewardship. But if you put it another way, really our job is to project and protect the credibility and image of the Department of Defense in the entertainment space. And for us, the entertainment space is vast and includes movies, TVs, documentaries, video games, live events, and even uh, a bit of social media. Wow. So you're an Air Force veteran. I I looked you up and and you've held a number of jobs within the Defense Department and around the defense community. Um, I saw that at one point you were a senior military advisor at the State Department and a later comms director at uh, Pratt & Whitney. But you've also served as the head entertainment liaison for the Air Force. So was there something about the entertainment aspect of the job that appealed to you in particular? Are you a big movie buff or is this just kind of how things shook out for you? You know, this is a a great opportunity to see a different side of entertainment. I loved my job. It was my last job uh, on active duty out in LA as the director of the Air Force Entertainment Liaison Office. It was a great job. It was a lot of fun. I had a lot of great coworkers uh, and colleagues from the various services and no two days were ever the same. So it was kind of a a fun thing. It wasn't so much a movie thing because it it goes, to be honest, quite far beyond movies, Mm -hmm. but it was really just a fun opportunity in a very unique role. And I never in a million years thought when I left that there'd be an opportunity to come back in a different capacity. I really thought it was a, it was a great four years, something fun to do. And I enjoyed ever coming to work every day. And then when I saw this job come open, this job was held by my two successors. Uh, Phil Strube had this for over 30 years, three decades mm-hmm. plus. And he's a legend. He left very, very big shoes to fill. And uh, Dave Evans uh, did a fantastic job coming in after Phil and cracking the code on working with many different studios and and kind of bringing us up to date on social media and kind of the new venues for for entertainment media. So I've got some pretty big shoes to fill there. And I'm just really excited about the people that are still working in the uh, entertainment offices, the Army, the Navy, the Marines, uh, and our Coast Guard friends, as well as my old Air Force office. It's fun to reconnect with those folks and uh, be able to see the great work that they're doing. So what does your day-to-day look like? I'm aware that you just got started in your role, but how does your sort of time break down? Well, you know, with COVID, it's a very unique time right now in the industry, not just for me, but for the folks in the entertainment industry writ large, whether it's movies or TV um, or, you know, clearly live events. There's just not a lot of production going on. So it's a bit quiet. And that's kind of a great opportunity for me to come in. There are no two days alike, which is another good news. And that's kind of one of the things that draws me to this job. But I would say that on a given day, we are reading scripts. Um, The one thing that's still going on in Hollywood is writing. They're Mm. fiercely writing and uh, trying to stay top of mind with writers in Hollywood uh, for both television and movies, and also, you know, our unscripted documentaries as well. My documentary colleague, Christine Thompson, has been in the office for a couple of years. She's fantastic, and she has done an immense amount of work. I do about probably 15 to 20 scripted movies or television shows 
a year. Uh, on a slow year for Christine, she does 115 to 120 production assistance agreements for documentaries, for unscripted things. So we are very, very busy in the documentary realm. So Christine's busy doing that stuff while I'm kind of reading scripts and reaching out to studios. And, and you know how it is in the first six weeks, letting people know that there's been a change, talk, uh, reconnecting with studios, with producers, with directors, with the guilds, with video game companies. So you name it, it's been a, it's been a fun gamut of, of meeting people, reintroducing ourselves and kind of plotting the way forward. If I'm a movie or a TV show producer and I want access to a base or other DOD support on a project, I understand that can run the range from using equipment to having people appear in shots to a number of other things. Uh, what is that process? How do I request support and how is that request then evaluated? So that's a great question. And there's a typical fighter pilot answer, right? There's more than one, you know, it depends. So there's Plenty of ways. If you uh, look at the individual services, each service has their own website. You can go to that website if you know specifically you want to work with that service. And you can click on a link and find a very, very simple form to fill out. It's, uh, you know, for the Air Force, I know we made it as simple as we could back in the day. It was one form. You can fill it out. Uh, send it to us. And that's all you have to do. It doesn't have to be anything more than that. And then that will get a phone call from our office to start to vet the vetting process to see what we can do to work with you. I will tell you there are some things that are, are pretty important. You have to have funding and distribution. As I was talking about with Christine's documentary and the load of work there, that's an easy discriminator early on to determine how far we're going to be able to get to us to help you and to assist you uh, in your production wishes. Mm. There's a lot of folks that want to come shoot the movie, but they don't have funding or they don't have distribution. And so for us, that's it's a big lift. It's a heavy lift to go ahead and do those kind of things. So we need to make sure that we're good stewards of the taxpayers' money and their resources, and we only utilize those resources and make them available for things that are really going to be seen in the public eye. So we look at your distribution. How wide is it? Is it a major studio, uh, or is it somebody that's going to take it to a, a film festival and try and sell it with fingers crossed? Mm. That's probably less likely to gain our support. Okay, so funding and distribution is a big part. What else, when you're reading these scripts and going through the vetting process, what are the things that are red flags where you say, okay, we can't support this? Or what are you looking at when you're evaluating projects that you can support? That's a great question. Thanks for asking it. It's um, some of the things we look for really are, are core values, right? Does this project uphold the core values and, and show the core values of the Department of Defense and the men and women that work in the individual services both military, civilian, officer, enlisted, active guard reserve across the entire spectrum of defense. Does this script uphold the core values that we have as an organization that are system-wide? So that's a, another very easy discriminator. It doesn't mean that the there can't be a bad person, a, a villain per se, who is in uniform. Um, mm. As long as it actually upholds the integrity of the men and women in uniform and uh, the ability to do their job. Also, we don't really want to be portrayed as incompetent technicians mm. uh, because uh, you're not going to find an incompetent technician in the military. I mean, really, you're weeded out pretty fast if you're not able to do your job. And so for us, we're looking for professionalism. Humor is good. We laugh at ourselves. We're happy to laugh at ourselves. Like I said, it's not unheard of to have a, a bad guy or bad gal, so to speak, in a, you know, in a villain's role. As long as in the end, we're upholding those core values, it's kind of really what we look for. Are you sort of the, the one man clearinghouse to make those decisions? Or do you ever call people in for a second opinion? Oh, uh, no, no. So I'm never the one man. It's never a one person show. So here at the Department of Defense, we have the ability to approve the services doing any of their production assistances, but um, we don't have the tasking authority. So I can't tell, hey, Air Force, go do this, or hey, Navy, go do this. The services are very independent in the way that they can do that. We help, we give permission in the way of a uh, production assistance agreement or a PAA. Mm. And that is usually pushed up from the services. They determine, you know, if they're interested in doing this and we'll go through together, but it is seen by uh, a number of eyes. I would say probably no less than seven or eight sets of eyes look at this and determine, is this something that we want to do? And is it a doable ask? 
um, how much, how heavy is the lift going to be for the services and the units that are involved? You know, that's a really driving factor, our operations tempo and our personnel tempo, depending on what we can and can't give. And we also have classification issues that we're concerned about. But I would tell you in the four things I look for are security, accuracy, policy, and propriety, right? Those four things, is it proper? Is it the right way that we want to represent ourselves in the public eye? So historically, you know, for projects that do kind of get the green light, yes, we'll support, we'll participate. What is the high end of support resources that the DOD can provide or has provided in the past? Well, that's another great question. I'll tell you a a couple good examples. If we're talking scripted movies, Top Gun Maverick. Hmm. (laughs) My colleagues at the Navy, I'm jealous that I wasn't in. I missed all that when they did all that great work. But that was two plus years of, of heavy work that the Navy did with Paramount. Uh, to get access for uh, not just Tom Cruise, but the entire cast onto naval bases, onto aircraft carriers, into fighter jets. You can imagine the uh, heavy lift that that is to get, you know, they were using uh, IMAX quality cameras, six mounts inside of a jet, inside of an F-18. There's a lot there. And so our Navy folks did a fantastic job working that. And that was a very, very heavy uh, amount of logistics that was involved. Conversely for the Air Force, or actually uh, in addition to that, the Air Force did a great job on Captain Marvel. Oh, yeah. um, Which you saw recently. And we were very proud of the depiction uh, that Brie put into uh, Carol Danvers, who are the fictional Air Force fighter pilot. We're proud of the portrayal that she did. We were happy to work with Marvel and Disney, uh, just fantastic companies that have been great production partners with us, just as Paramount has. And so a lot of heavy logistics. They say that great, uh, good generals talk about tactics, but great generals talk about logistics, it said. And I would say that's very true in the movie industry as well. Well, my audience is particularly interested in Top Gun Maverick. Anytime we do a story, uh, everyone is so excited for this movie to come out. And I know the first Top Gun was a, a real sort of triumph of collaboration. But were there any new trails blazed in supporting that sequel in particular that has just been in production? Well, you know, to quote that movie, we could tell you, but we'd have to kill you. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's uh, no, literally, um, you know, I'll leave that to Paramount. It looks like it's been pushed back to July 2nd of next year, the opening. Mm-hmm. So we're very excited about it. We were disappointed that, you know, it wasn't able to come out due to COVID, but we're excited. I, I think it was the right move. We're all in agreement that pushing it back into July is the right choice because that that is a movie that begs to be seen on the big screen. And so, and I, I love it because it's, it's authentic, right? It is, um, it's shot in such a way that you can't imagine doing that on a green screen. It's not something that you can use CGI for and have that same effect. So we're excited. The cast was phenomenal in the back of the jets. And I think you'll see that realism and that it just begs to be seen on a big screen. So I think it's the right move to push that back to July. Well, I have to ask just one more Top Gun Maverick question. I mean, you've got cameos from the F-35, which I know as a reporter who's covered the Joint Strike Fighter, they're very particular about how you can shoot it and you know what you can and, and can't reveal on this very highly networked fighter. And you've also got what looks like some Lockheed Skunk Works platform in the preview there. So when you talk about classification, how do you work around those uh, particular challenges when you've got those cutting edge platforms on the screen? Well, you know, the bulk of the movie is really about the F-18. And so there, there's, uh, of course, other airframes in there that you've seen in the trailer. And I don't want to say too much more. I think I'll punt that to our friends at Paramount and let them uh, discuss because I don't want to give anything away and spoil a, a great movie for you. We'll be right back. Hey, Left of Boom fans, this is Amy Bouchotts, executive editor of Military.com. If you're looking to keep up with all the news and information you need to make your military or veteran life successful, we've got the perfect resource. Military.com is packed with need-to-know intel on everything U.S. military, from pay and benefit calculators to the latest from your military service to deep dives into Pentagon policy, Military.com's reporters and editors are on top of it. Find more at Military.com. Now, back to Left of Boom. 
let's back up to the predecessor. And I know this must be a little bit difficult as an Air Force veteran with all these questions about this panegyric to naval aviation. But the first <laughs> Top Gun sparked a lot of rumors. Basically, you know, it was reported that the Navy set up recruiting tables outside movie theaters where Top Gun was playing because it was such a hit and sort of this triumph of collaboration. Some say naval recruiting actually increased that year because of interest in the movie. Can you speak to that at all? Is that a true story or is that just a, a rumor? Well, let me kill one rumor right away. And the rumor that we, that I heard in the Air Force all the time from people in Hollywood was, well, we heard that Top Gun was initially supposed to be an Air Force movie. I'll tell you that's absolutely not true. Uh, and, and I think Russ Coons, who's a retired naval captain who runs the Navy office, he would back me up 100% and say, that's absolutely not true. This has always been a Navy movie, always supposed to be a Navy movie. So uh, good on the Navy for doing that. I can't speak to what they did back in 1986 when it came out. I know I saw it in the theaters. I was 17 years old and uh, <laughs> I joined the Air Force. I enlisted in the Air Force as a uh, aircraft maintainer not long after I saw that movie. Oh, so, you're take, <laughs> you know, so take from that what you will. I, I don't know directly that it was that it had any impact on me, but I could just tell you that I think clearly it's in the zeitgeist of, you know, is that a word? Zeitgeist? It's in the zeitgeist of American pop culture now. And it, it's kind of taken on its own thing. It's it's a shame it's taken 34 years for a, a sequel, but maybe that's a great thing. And, and it's time for a new generation to see it. I think everyone's excited for it. I can't wait to see it. And uh, I think clearly everything that I've heard over the years from my Navy colleagues and counterparts is that it certainly did a lot to increase the visibility of the Navy and kind of capture the imagination of naval aviation and, and young people that get them interested in naval aviation. So I would be remiss if I talked about a few projects that historically the DoD has said we prefer not to collaborate on these. And so I've heard that that list includes Forrest Gump and the Avengers franchise that they wanted military support and access, but the scripts didn't pass muster. Again, I know these projects predate you by quite a bit, but are you able to talk through that and why those particular decisions were made? So I don't know about Forrest Gump. I've heard that also, um, but I don't know specifically what happened with Forrest Gump. I can tell you, you know, Disney and Marvel have been fantastic partners and they, they work with us to help us, you know, in the script. We were strong partners with them on Iron Man 1 and Iron Man 2. You've seen the part, that partnership has grown with Captain Marvel. I think briefly, you know, we were looking at Captain America, uh, the Winter Soldier back, you know, in 2013 or so. Some of those scenes were shot in Washington, D.C., but typically I think uh, I, I can't speak to exactly what it was in the script that didn't work out for the Department of Defense. But I can tell you that moving forward, I think you can expect a robust, you know, we're very excited to work with Marvel. We have a couple of projects that Marvel will uh, will talk about and Disney will speak on uh, later on. But uh, we're already at work and, and we've some of the things we've actually completed that we're awaiting uh, to see the final product. So just excited to work with Marvel and Disney and um, look forward to continuing that partnership. Well, that's a cliffhanger. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> Lots so of great curious. things. But you, you know what happens. You can't speak outside the lines with Marvel or Disney. So we're very respectful of, of all of our partners because they trust you with um, whether we can work with them or not. Credibility is our currency in, in uh, the movie business. And so if we can't be trusted to read a script, then really no one's going to want to work with us. It's going to be a very short career for all of us. So really, we have to be able to read the script, vet it, and even in the instances where we can't make it work, give it back without uh, comments just to respect the process and respect the filmmakers. It's also important to say that we're not trying to change anybody's film. Uh, mm -hmm. We love to work with the film writers. We've actually sat down in writer's rooms with you know screenwriters and production teams to help strengthen and add credibility to their stories. But typically, you're not going to see us suggesting stories. You're not going to see us trying to bend a story a certain way. We're happy to answer questions. We're happy to, like I said, add credibility. But typically, you will not see us. Our job is not to go out and sell a mission set or sell a story or tell producers, directors, even casting leads how to do their job. Uh, we really leave that to them, and we are just here as a partner to help make their show better. Along those same lines, is there an appeals process, or have you ever had in this office folks who were turned down once who said, okay, on our own initiative, we want to go back and, and rewrite and try again and see if we can make this work? So the beauty of that is we work with a lot of folks multiple times. If you look at it, there's some some folks just like to work with us. 
a lot and we tend to work with those people more and more. For instance, if you look at television, we have had a robust relationship with NCIS, NCIS New Orleans, uh, Hawaii Five O, which has completed its run, uh, Magnum PI. So CBS knows, they understand us going back to JAG and Donald Belisario's TV shows. They understand kind of how to work with the Department of Defense. Conversely, uh, on, the, on the movie side, you have folks like Ian Bryce, who's a producer who has worked with us on multiple platforms and, and uh, shows, the Transformers movie franchise, for example. And they understand how to work with us because they've done it multiple times. In those instances, of course, it's not really an appeals process per se. They kind of learn as we go kind of what the Department of Defense is willing to say yes to, what we're not, what are kind of, what's the third rail and what are the red flags that we would look for. Some of the folks, I would tell you, some of the things that we do, that we turn down, we're just not able to support Mm. um, flat out. Uh, There are some things that we've seen that there's almost no way that they're going to be able to, it's, it's so integral to their story, but it is so not falling in our core values that we're not able to support regardless. And they'll, we'll make that pretty clear early on in the production. It's always respectful. It's always good. And we always have the door open for folks to come back. And then lastly, I would say people do come back. It's not really a formal appeals process, but we work with writers, particular writers, but everybody, like I said, we'll say, hey, as this stands, we can't work on this project. But let me tell you, here are some of the red flags that we have and here's why we'd like to give it back to you. Maybe think about it, come back to us if you're interested. And sometimes they'll come back and they'll say, well, what about this or what about that? So it is definitely a collaborative effort. And we like that collaboration with industry very much. When people come and they say, we want active duty troops as extras, are you able to say yes to that? And what does that process look like if that's something that they want? And there's different processes. So thanks for that great question. For background actors, yes, we robustly cast members of the military into roles in movies and television as often as we can. Uh, That adds to the credibility and the realism that goes on. There are some requirements. Those folks that are there are getting paid by the production company. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they must be on leave. They have to have permission from their commander. We vet them to make sure that they're good representatives of the Department of Defense, that there's no impending discipline problems or any other issues. But generally speaking, we strive to have them look like you know, reflect the ranks of the active duty military. So um, we strive for the diversity aspect. You know, we want to show the wide diversity of folks that are in the Department of Defense. We want to show the wide range of jobs that are available. We want to show, you know, all of uh, the best things about being a member of the military. And, And the way the process works is very simple. They have to volunteer. We'll usually put out a call the day before, not generally longer than one or two days before. And it's usually a very early start. It's a 4 or 5 a.m. showtime and the producers will come by. A lot of times we'll ask them, you know, they'll, a lot of times they get put into different uniforms with different names on them. And there's a lot of legal reasons for that. But often you'll see a different name uh, on their name tape. Um, We cast them. It's very simple. I've seen producers come by with a line of 20 different troops and say, I'd like him, him, her, her, and him. Hmm. Those five out of 20 come and they'll put them over here. They'll put 10 more over there. And before you know it, I mean, you have a very credible looking scene because it is. These are the actual airmen that know the jobs and that are doing the work. And it's great for us to show off. There's no better uh, actor than an actual, you know, soldier, sailor, airman, marine, coast guardsman that is out there doing their job on a day to day basis. Well, what a fun day's work. Kind of transitioning. I, I wanted to talk about some of the more sort of proactive engagement focused parts of your job. You mentioned that you don't pitch narratives necessarily, but how do you help kind of communicate what the military is and what it does and, and sort of how to portray the military before people approach you with a script or a particular ask? That's the fun part. So this is the project part of project and protect, right? And to me, that's much more fun. The project is much more fun than the protect part. Um, but I will tell you that the services do a great job at this. All four of the branches, plus our, our Coast Guard colleagues and the Department of Homeland Security, they all do a great job and soon to be our Space Force. For instance, uh, the Navy does a program called Hollywood to the Navy, where uh, on weekends they'll take reporters or civic leaders or Um, people in the entertainment industry, whether they're writers or producers, directors, actors, location managers, um, and drive them down to San Diego and show them around a destroyer or a sub or an aircraft carrier. And that's pretty impressive to do. Take 
come out and see some some aircraft, show them special forces that are you know down uh, operating down in that area. Um, and it's just a great way to get the imagination flowing. Also, we will do things like uh, on the Air Force, we did what we call an industry leader tour. Where uh, similar, we filled a C-17 at Edwards Air Force Base with about 40 different people, 40 to 50. And those are writers, producers, directors. We flew them mm. up to Alaska. We put them through cool school, the Arctic Survival Training School. We made them eat squirrels and fish, fresh caught fish from you know Alaska right there. They had to endure sub-zero temperatures just for a few minutes, just to get an idea, to get a taste of what the military folks are going through. They got to see uh, F-22 fighters. They got to see the Air National Guard combat search and rescue folks in action. Um, so it's really an immersive experience. And it's uh, a great, it's fun for us to show off. It's fun for them to see. And it's fun for them to meet each other and mingle with each other and make those connections in the industry as well. So it's really, I keep in touch with all the the various folks over the years, even after I got out, who are just continue to rave about those kind of experiences. Uh, The Army does a fantastic thing. They went to Fort Irwin last year uh, and took a bunch of folks up there. So all of the services tend to do their own way of doing that. And then here at the Department of Defense, my colleague Christine Thompson and I will kind of reach out. I spend a lot of time talking to the studios. I spend time talking with the guilds. And in fact, I just uh, reached out to the Writers Guild last week to kind of see, hey, what would you guys be interested in in a time of COVID Mm -hmm. when there's not a lot of production going on? What can we do to help you guys continue to do uh, your writing with authenticity towards the military? And they they asked for uh, some folks on a chat room actually said, it'd be great if you could put together a panel that taught us uh, military jarg- uh, jargon and lingo. We want to know <laughs> you guys have a funny way of speaking. You use a lot of acronyms. You use a lot of funny terms. Can we have three or four people sit down and do two hours of just, you know, teaching us military lingo and what it means and, and how you guys talk the way you talk? And I said, that would actually be good for us because with the five different services we have, we have vastly different lingo amongst ourselves. So it's a learning experience for everybody when we have it. Um, but really, it's just a fun way to, to keep in touch with, with screenwriters and folks that are interested. So we're looking at setting that up. We also attend things like Comic-Con. Mm-hmm. We attend South by Southwest. And we do panels. Uh, we do panels at the Locations Managers Guild. We do a lot of different panels, the Produced By Conference that they have. Um, the Contenders is an event that is held in LA every year around awards time for awards. So we attend these events, uh, often wearing uniforms, and that sparks interest and conversation. We always get the UFO question. Uh, people think when we're at Comic-Con, when we're in uniform, people think that we're doing cosplay. We're not really military members. And then when they find out you are a military member, they all want to know where the UFOs are and where the alien autopsy is. And I'm sorry, Hope, I can't tell you that. (laughs) Well, there's a new DOD task force that was formed for exactly that purpose. So There is indeed. Uh, (laughs) Truth is stranger than fiction. On the same topic, I was talking with some people in the last year from the National Commission for Military National Public Service that recently completed a report for Congress. And one of the things that they raised was the importance of communicating to the public the diversity of military roles. So not everyone in the military is a grunt or a fighter pilot, no matter what you might see in the movies. And I'm aware of things like the DOD's Know Your Mill campaign, which at least internally kind of seeks to communicate that same thing. So is that one of your priorities? I mean, is is that something that you seek to communicate, expanding sort of the portrayal of military roles and positions that you know, serve the country and the national defense? There is such a huge amount of different jobs. And, and again, this goes back to lingo, right? In the Air Force, we call it the Air Force Specialty Codes or AFSCs. In the Army, it's called the MOS, the Military Occupational System. So there's a lot of different ways, but there's so many jobs out there and we want to represent all of them. That's what we love about And really, that's what's exciting to me about the Department of Defense job as opposed to the Air Force job, which I also loved. But it's it's getting to see this incredible breadth and depth of experience in the military. And two people who have 30-year careers in the military can have such an incredibly different experience Mm -hmm. because you're literally in every single air space, cyberspace, land, sea. It doesn't matter. There's something going on everywhere. And it's you're in the Arctic, you're in the desert, you're in the jungle. And the, the various jobs that you're doing are just so widespread. It's hard to fathom and to get an actual count. I know just for instance, in the Air Force, I think there's about 250 different 
AFSCs across the active officer and enlisted ranks. Um, there's 250 different jobs you can have just inside the Air Force alone. And every one of them is interesting in its own way. Um, and it's really fun when you can mix them together and kind of see exactly how this is happening. And then take a look at the uh, Navy. The Navy, as we just talked about, they have folks that are on surface ships. They have folks in submarines. They have folks on aircraft carriers or in aircraft or who are special operators or folks that are, you know, not out in the fleet, but are, you know, back at the headquarters. I mean, all mm -hmm. of these are, you know, are intelligence operations, um, space operations. It's just such a wide variety. Hope we can talk all day about it, but it's so much... It's such a rich um, area for storytelling and for creative minds and innovative minds to tell stories. And that's what we're here to help. We are open for business to help screenwriters and producers and directors tell those stories. The protect part is saying no to the hard things, but generally speaking, all of the services are, do a great job of, of being open and uh, actively seeking to help filmmakers at all levels tell their story. So you've been at pains several times to communicate that creators retain their independence. You're not out to kind of squelch any narratives or right. say, rewrite your story. It's right. mainly a, a yes or no function. Like, yes, we can support. Yes, we can help. No, this doesn't really serve our interests. So we're not going to be a part of this. But I know, you know, you still get sort of the criticisms that this is sort of a propaganda arm of the, the U.S. military for lack of better words. So I thought I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up that criticism and just let you kind of address it as fully as you wish to. I mean, how do you see that role? And, you know, why is this, I guess, just how would you respond to that criticism? I would say that the thing that differentiates us from, you know, the word that I think was used was propaganda is that, you know, propaganda generally is not truthful or accurate. I would say that here we strive only to tell the truth and inaccuracy. And that's what we offer to filmmakers. And they know that. I think that's why filmmakers come back and, and utilize us over and over because they know that they're going to get credible and truthful, authentic information that will help add that authenticity and credibility to their end product. I don't really feel like it's propaganda in any way, shape, or form because they're coming to us and asking the questions. We're giving them honest answers. And in the end, it makes their product better and uh, gives it that extra amount of credibility and truthfulness. Even if it's you know a, a fictional story, clearly Iron Man doesn't exist, but we're happy to help make that you know roadies time in the Air Force as authentic as we possibly can. And kind of what would happen if Iron Man did exist how would this work with us? How would that fit into a, a, the Department of Defense as realistically as it could? And so we strive for that authenticity, whether it's a true story. And, and sometimes, to be honest with you, the true stories are the best ones. There's so mm -hmm. many great stories that are happening. And we have some coming up I wish I could tell you about. But, and also many more that we've already done, that you've already seen, that point to the heroism and the, the great things that the men and women of, of the armed forces do on a day-to-day -day basis. The best stories are the true ones. and that, that's not propaganda. Well said. Well, that's a great note to end on. I do have a final question as we wrap things up. You mentioned Space Force in passing as they kind of stand up their operation. So there's this Netflix show that came out. I just was kind of curious, did they come to you guys at all and look for help? I know that there's been some challenge with even disambiguation there since they are uh, feuding with the real one on, on Twitter and all that. But I, I was curious if they tried to collaborate at all. Is General Naird based on anybody? No, I was. <laughs> uh, no, I, I thought it was a it was a funny show. I watched it myself. To my knowledge, they didn't come to us directly, but certainly they have consultants who have worked in the Department of Defense and inside, you know, uh, space operations. And so several things they got were uh, true and accurate. But uh, clearly, it's it's funny, and you know, we like to poke fun at ourselves, but we have a limit. We're a, a public. Um, we want to, like I said, accurately portray our men and women in uniform. That didn't entirely accurately portray our men and women. It's a, it's a good parody. Certainly, it's funny. You know, I love Steve Carell myself. I think that he's, he's a very funny guy. But uh, I don't think that was an accurate and credible portrayal of the Department of Defense or the Space Force. So I think, uh, and they probably knew that coming in. So that's why I think we didn't get a call. Well, thank you so much for your time today. This is a very fun conversation. And I learned a lot. I, I really appreciate your insights. Thanks, Hope. Thanks so much. Come back anytime. Thanks again for listening to Left of Boom. Will you be watching Top Gun Maverick? Do you know of a unique military-related job that we should feature in a future episode? 
You know what to do. Send me an email at podcast at military.com. We have some really fascinating interviews lined up that I promise you will not want to miss. So make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you get your shows. Your ratings and reviews help other people find the show. So please take the time to do that. And don't forget that you can subscribe to our brand new entertainment newsletter at ease for free if you want to learn more about military-related film and TV projects and much, much more. That and all the news and information you need about the military community is available every day at military.com.